All right, this is the um, uh, this is the March 26, 2014, uh, Open Crowbar Community Planning Meeting, in which we review our previous sprint achievements in the last sprint. Um, then uh, we review our overall goals and discuss uh, any short-term and long-term goals and criteria to meet those goals. Um, any community planning topics. Uh, upcoming conferences and meetups, uh, other resources available, and finally um, enumerate um, our likely upcoming sprint stories um, and uh, try to um, put a finer point on focusing our work. And if there's any time left, we will do a, a demo or technical review of um, whatever interesting stuff we've made for this past sprint. Um, so. Rob, would you like to take it away with um, the um, uh, our previous sprint achievements for this past sprint? I'd be I'd be happy to. Um, so let me let me actually bring up the document. If you don't if you don't mind typing a little bit, I will uh, go through what what we've done. It, it's been really productive uh, since we did the the official Open Crowbar migration uh, about I guess last two sprints ago. I'll try to break break off my board and get organized. Keep watching. Um, I feel like we've we've really been been making a lot of progress. So, as you know, we fully moved over to Open Crowbar and we've been migrating everything out of the Crowbar One repos um, and making sure we didn't have any any hanging Chad codes. That work is almost complete. All the core uh, work has been moved over, but the um, some of the migration for IPMI and OpenStack is still, is still hanging, and that's actually part of what we're planning for this sprint. Um, we did a lot of uh, refactor and cleanup in this last sprint, so we pulled out the this whole snapshot concept. It was a big deal um, to remove. We added uh, referential integrity con constraints. Uh, we fixed a whole bunch of uh, 500 API. There were some UI bugs that we fixed. Um, if you missed it, the, the CLI for Crowbar has been really strong. Um, oh, my goodness, we got the RPM. We're actually um, publishing RPMs. Uh, we can install from RPM. We're still tuning that. It's a little bit flaky. Um, Golden Sledgehammer is actually next sprint officially because um, all the polls haven't come in yet. But So um, one of the things that we're, we're doing in this coming sprint is we have switched from having from having uh, sledgehammer have to be built by each person, and we now have a consistent one. That is in part because we changed the API. So one of the things that in this sprint, um, yay! Uh, in this sprint, we uh, refactored the node create process. I think I thought we did a technical session about that, but maybe maybe we didn't. So it's the node, it's no create API, the creation process, yeah, API process. This is really important. What we what we did was I tried to explain this last week and, and was not very coherent in it. Um, we used to have one API called that created a node and added to the, the system deployment, and that was causing us problems because a whole bunch of decisions were being made in in that transaction. It also exposed a whole bunch of transaction boundary issues uh, within the code base. So, uh, and, and it also forced us to do these weird things called hints that were sort of out of keeping with the rest of the schema. So, uh, we split node creation into a couple of discrete uh, steps. You create a node, you add it to a deployment, you commit it, um, and so those is, those are the basic steps. You have to turn it on. You have to mark it alive. And you also have to say that it's available um, for action. And those those changes really streamline uh, how we can handle nodes. One of the things that we're working towards is how Docker works, uh, how how we can create Docker nodes because Docker nodes have their own challenges. Yay! Um, you don't have to create any deployment. You use the system deployment. You have to add. You basically have to add Crowbar Manage node to the um, right. 
it's the Kerber Management Node role. Right. And one of the things, Judd, that um, hold on, I actually have that thing up here. You and I, you and I have been fumbling on this. There's a crowbar node bind. Um, I believe it's like bind name.foo.confu. There's a, this is actually a CLI command to do this, so you, so you can do it from the CLI if you need it. Um, and yeah, because right now the, the one of the things the next sprint is to fix the bootstrapping process. Uh -huh. Uh, there's also there are also a couple of uh, small bugs that we're trying to fix. Uh, the other one I want to do is this AJAX confirmation on uh, forms. So those are just these are just UI glitches or anything else. So when you do multiple stars, does that create the indent indention for us? I don't. I hope so. <laughs> That's the way it is in uh, in MediaWiki. So I'm just assuming. I'm, I'm going to test it in the Markdown editor. That's cool. Um, I think Markdown it spaces before the star. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no, we um uh we got. Um, okay. there's, there's a lot, a lot more stuff that we do. Yay, Berkshell. And that, that actually comes into next sprint. So that's, that's making partial progress. We also started doing um, work to create a puppet jig. Mm. Uh, so that's that's pretty exciting work to see us having our puppet our puppet pieces going. Um, oh, the other the other thing we did in this is that we made the default attributes um, automatically editable. So if you've defined attributes when a node, a node role is in proposal, you can actually edit them. And along those lines, we've demonstrated. Uh, heterogeneous OS deployments. Hmm. Thing you have to know is that you uh, you have to populate the um, the cache so that the provisioner um, base OS um, so yeah there's there's code in there that got in quietly that um, actually identifies which OSs are available based on ISOs that are in the cache. And so um, provisional will automatically package those into bootable packet into bootable forms. It's pretty pretty slick. Um, wow. I we've we've been busy. Yeah. <laughs> A lot busier uh, than I realized once you uh, look at it from uh, thirty thousand feet. <laughs> We're getting a lot done. Oh yeah. No, and, and one of the things that's, that's interesting in this stuff is that um, you know the doc, with the Docker admin, it's super fast, um, and so that that's been really uh, very powerful. But that's previous sprint, still Docker admin stuff is pretty good. Um, good, good. Oh, you're making numbers. I like it. Um, so, and so let's, let me look at the backlog a little bit. So one of the things that I'll note in this. Uh, or somebody who might be listening to this recording, <laughs> uh, is that we, we actually have a, ah, and I, somebody deep in. Yeah. I don't see him on the, the list. Hello, who just joined? Uh, this is Justin Bovey. I'm following the project, so I figured I'd just join on in to hear more about it. Excellent. Your, your timing is good. We're going through um, 
accomplishments from the last sprint and uh, talking through what what we're do what we're working on in this sprint. If you you can join on the Etherpad or um, I'll post the link. Uh, or on the just join me share. We'll give you the, the visual. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say that the the Agile we actually use Dell uses the internal Agile board, um, and we have plans to to open that up and make it to actually use the uh, backlog board over time. One of the things we're trying to do is we're building up to get a gated CI going for Open Crowbar, and um, I think once we have that, then in order to get through the gate, you're, we're going to also need to have people working against stories in, in the backlog. We're, being, we're still being a little bit loose on that, but the purpose of this meeting is to actually go through the things that Dell has in its backlog for this sprint um, and encourage anybody else who wants to work on things in this sprint and make commitments uh, to put them, put them on the, on the you know, show them and share them so that we can Create, make sure there's resources to do pull requests and reviews as part of the, the sprint. Yeah, and even uh, developer bring up support. Developer bring up support included. That's a great point. Um, in the past, we found that uh, if we don't coordinate other people's support coming in, then it's hard to make sure that it's prioritized for review. This is part of the process. Uh, and then, so the things that we're, we're looking at seeing in, in the coming sprint, uh, Golden Sledgehammer is, uh, means that you don't have to build Sledgehammer yourself, that we have a published one. And Sledgehammer, it's important to note, Sledgehammer changed. Um, let me make a note of this. Um, so, uh, one of the things that when we changed the, the node create API process, we had to change Sledgehammer because Sledgehammer creates nodes uh, as part of its, its cycle. So um, if you're using an old, older Sledgehammer, you must rebuild it. Um, hopefully, it's the last change to Sledgehammer for quite some time. Um, yeah, the, actually, I reviewed the pull request yesterday, and um, uh, building is not even recommended anymore. Is a um, the bring up process will download the sledgehammers automatically off of right. the oh, S3 bucket. That's right. And the, one of the components for that is there's actually a CRC check in Sledgehammer for virgining, versioning. So we, we wanted to not have people trip on having an old sledgehammer so we can actually now validate it um, based on uh, uh, CRC of the, the critical files inside of Sledgehammer. Cool. Uh, so thing, other things that are coming uh, in this sprint uh, is we're we're, start, we're doing research on okay on hardware um, and how we want to port over the hardware bar clamps. Uh, we've got RPM work continuing. The RPM work is important for uh, so future from this. Um, I'll add this as a building towards. So we have the hardware uh, integration. That's what we're working towards, and we're working towards a continuous integration. Uh, which would be a gated trunk. So uh, the RPM work is part of the continuous integration checks for this. Um, and then the other work that we have coming is uh, the Puppet uh, jig and being able to use Puppet with uh, Master. That's, we have, we've documented that. The other thing that we're working very hard with is the Berkshelf integration. So Berkshelf allows us to use um, uh, the Chef Upstreams. And so we're, we're, we've done a fair bit of work already on doing Chef Upstreams, but we pause that while we work on Berkshelf. Uh, yes, Berkshelf 3. Uh, so those those things allow us to be much more flexible in, in where the cookbooks come in for how Crowbar operates, uh, and we'll bring over the open the Crowbar two work that we did in the old repos, and we'll bring those into Open Crowbar, hopefully starting in the sprint. But we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the other thing we're building towards 
uh, with some of the refactoring we've done is uh, Docker, being able to use Docker as, as nodes. And so we made a lot of progress with Docker early on, and then that exposed some workflow challenges that Docker offers uh, very specifically that you can't easily set IP addresses for Docker nodes. Uh, you can't change their names. You can't change their DNS entries. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's things that we had to, to change in our workflows to make them more flexible. Oh, that's actually something that's coming in the next sprint. Uh, I'll add it over here, which is um, new uh, role types. Um, it is a, oh, Victor has a name for this. I, I'm always blanking on the name for it. Um, it provides. What's that? This, this is so cool. So the idea is we've been using node roles consistently as milestone points. And so, no, sorry, no op roles as, as milestone points. So the, the, and the UI is tweaked for this, so that when you're, when you're actually looking at deployment, you don't look at the individual node roles. You can set them. But what you're really doing is you're picking the set of node roles, uh, no op roles that you want to implement. So there are things like installing an OS or becoming a Chrome or managed node or a Ceph, Ceph capability, things like that. And one of the things that the Docker work requires you to do is it requires you to say, you know what, I look just like a Crowbar managed node. I provide the same services as that no-op role. But you know what, you don't have to have any of the predecessors of that role, of the no-op role, to become a Crowbar managed node if you're Docker. So we're going to have a Docker managed node that provides the Crowbar managed node role, and it has its own dependency graph. And what that means is that you can have all sorts of downstream stuff that uses the Crowbar managed node or the Crowbar installed node. Uh, you, can, you can just use those, assuming they're there, but they're not there. They've actually been done by a different role. So it's not exactly an alias because it's, it's actually taking over your, the whole forward dependency graph. Uh, but it provides this really cool um, way to say, you know what, and, and we came up with other examples besides Docker. Because Docker, you don't need node discovery. You just say, oh, I'm, poof, you're instantly an installed OS node. And a lot of the things that we have to do, we, we don't do with Docker. But the same thing would be true if you wanted to provide a database. You could actually have a no-op role for a database. And then uh, our default might be Postgres, and it would just build a Postgres uh, database. But you could actually substitute uh, MySQL database or uh, or I don't care, Oracle, uh, whatever you wanted. And then you would just install that and say, this, these roles provide the database no-op role. And then it provides you with an alternate path uh, to implement parallel functionality. Is it that the, these roles provide the no-op role, or they provide the roles in order to achieve the state that gets you to the no-op? It, they provide what it takes to get to the no-op role. But you don't want the no-op role because the no-op role has prerequisites. So it's effectively an alternate no-op role, or it's an alternate end state. I, this, this really should be our topic for next week's technical call because Victor's, Victor's actively building it in right now. Um, uh, and it's Will no-op roles continue to survive in this design? Uh, yeah, yeah, I know we should take the bubble. No-op roles are essential because they, they are the, the, the milestones. They, they describe your t stable states, your target states. I almost wish we'd name them differently, but yeah, that's what they are. Um, we had no idea when we, we built them that they were going to be as important. I had an inkling, but they ended up being much more important than we realized. Can we change them to milestones? Uh, it's something to suggest. Um, I don't think it would be that hard to do, but because um, it's, it's a pretty distinctive word inside of the. 
have a need. Uh, cool. So that, I mean, that's a lot of good stuff. Um, BNCI we talked about. Um, Berkshire. And now, now I'm getting down down deeper. And then the other the other thing I wanted to go back to your agenda. Let's see. Agenda. Ah, we're. I think that's a pretty full sprint. Yeah. Should we head over to the release roadmap document or start talking about ship ready criteria before that? I, they're, they're one and the same. But we can, we can do that. Do I have that document up? So I'll give a little bit of preamble for this. So one of the things that um, we've wanted to do is move Crowbar into a quarterly release cycle. So I'm going to remove the highlights on this doc. Uh, oh, do you want to? Okay, you're going to give the cross link. Thank you. Uh, Ah, oh, there you go. So one of the things that we really want to see is Crowbar on a quarterly release cycle, um, which which is a pretty aggressive release cycle. But considering the that we end up bottlenecking the workloads, if we're not careful. We we think that a quarterly release cycle is warranted. Um, it means that we're going to have to be careful about how we slipstream things in, but uh, it seems like it's a, a good plan uh, from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, and the goal would be to have a release to release upgrade, upgradeability in doing this. And looking at our refactor and where we are with things, it, it actually feels to me like we're, we're, we're getting uh, to a hardening point where we can cut that uh, dot zero release and have people start looking at it as a stable thing um, and that, that'll make that'll make our conversations easier we need we need a release naming convention and, and we have to we should start a, a thread on that um, but I think first we need to get a little further on the very idea of having releases so I've tentatively just picked an ABC uh, naming paradigm which seems to be uh, popular in, in open source projects, uh, and then picked uh, alphabetical names for the first three release of Anvil, Broom, and Camshaft. Once again, following uh, the cool kids and the, what they're doing. So, yay. We and have a so technical word that's called alphabetical. Is that what it is? I thought I was just finding the cool kids. <laughs> cool kids do it alphabetically. Sure. We we could we could yeah use periodic table of elements, but only pick <laughs> noble gases. <laughs> oh, I would um, only pick ferrous metals. <laughs> uh, that would be appropriate for uh, for crowbar. Crowbar. Tool team sort of metal. Metal, uh, ductile metals. Um, okay, so uh, and we could rank them by tensile strength. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be so confusing. <laughs> oh, atomic <laughs> weight? No, tensile strength. Tensile strength. Uh, trade value on the on the index. Right? Do that. The highest value that would create some challenges as we. As Markets are valuable. We thought it was we run out of nickel. <laughs> once we run out of tensile strength, we can go to compression strength and do like concrete. I do. Yeah, we can do hybrid. It's a kneeled, kneeled material. All right. So for now, we're going to stick to alphabetical, just because we're not as creative as that. Um, <laughs> and so the the idea was this is something I circulated. Um, at least internally, I don't think I, I took it to the community at the time. 
um, just to look through some uh, some ideas to create the ship radio. So if I go to the Wayback Machine two years ago, uh, we we actually had created this thing that we call ship readiness. Uh, you could actually go back and find a whole bunch of documentation around what is ship ready. The idea with ship ready is that we, we have this minimum feature set that we think is sustainable um, and offers enough capability that people can then build workloads on top of it. Uh, and from my perspective, I think we're, we're there. Uh, and what I wanted to do is document what we've achieved from that perspective um, and what, what's remaining. And then once we hit that, call it a release. It'll be basically a, um, a little bit more than the beta, I think, at this point. But call that our ship ready release, and people can start doing targeting workloads for it, and they can uh, actually start using it, count on the API. So there, there's a contract at this point uh, that APIs will, you know, uh, APIs will stabilize, uh, databases will be migratable, Upgrades will be possible. Let me do this as a list. So, so, so far we've been um, having a little bit of fun and being, being, not being too worried about creating database migrations. Um, but I think it's, I think what we really want to be able to do is get to this first release uh, target and then uh, start enforcing this contract. And part of the goal here would be that we might make API changes between Anvil and Broom, but if we can avoid it, we won't, and they should be forwards uh, capability. And my, my hope is that we can actually do have, have the Anvil release in April. Um, May would be okay, but I have a preference towards April because I see it's alignment with OpenStack release cycles. Um, so if we are, how stable will the API be? Um, if in December we have the, the major number is API mm -hmm. changes, minor number is API implementation changes, and the, the minor, the business bug fix number, are we right. looking at a one level? Or it would be, I'd call, call that it two. I'd call it two. It's really two dot o. Two dot o Right. Okay. It kind of but think that two dot one dot o. Effectively. If um, the thing, if have, thing that uh, means our API has stabilized. Correct. And the next API change would have to be. Uh, because that's really what we're measuring here. Uh, the, ability, the ability for other, inter in other systems to interact with our system is that major number. Internal changes go this way. So, you know, this is public facing, the, the, the greatest number. So the number all the way on the left is, you know, public interface with Crowbar. Middle number is internal crowbar changes, and the last is bug fixes. Um, so we can be this. Yeah. We can also be that and say this is generally the API, but we're only in beta. That's probably the sensible thing to do, and then make the broom the target of the. So sort of what I'm thinking is camshaft is the hardened release, right? Camshaft would be in the fall, so October. And that would be the 2.0.0. I, I hate putting dates on these things yet, but I guess once we start a quarterly cycle, we've put a quarterly cycle, so yes, that's fine. Right, and then, yeah, so this is spring. And I'll just help you with that. 
Oh. <laughs> So that, that's sort of the, the concept with this. Um, I actually feel like the APIs have been stable. Um, the change, interestingly, the change we made to the process of creating those didn't really change the APIs particularly much. Um, oh. But I think we do need two releases of people using the APIs to, to before we say they're final. That makes sense to me. So the, the idea here is that the first this first release is really targeted at getting the base base stable. Um, that the summer release would, would bring in would really bring in the workloads. So even though we're working with the OpenStack um, staff workloads, what we're really seeing here is that um, those guys can start start porting with the idea of targeting the broom release as their 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 actual now it's ready release. Uh, clearly, we're not we're not going to have the open back upstreams ported in uh, fully in, in the in the spring of month. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have till June twentieth for it to still be spring, and then <laughs> June twenty first it becomes summer. Yeah, I, I really want to see this done before um, the OpenStack Summit. So, um, it, and this is this is where it's worth talking about what's necessary for ship readiness, right? So these are things I wrote down a while ago, but it's worth discussing. And I'm I'm not as interested in talking about um, broom and camshaft um, as I am about sort of figuring out what this these critical milestones for uh, Anvil are. To me, shipping means that other people are going to use your product, that third parties could integrate with it, which means a stable API. So that really mm -hmm. brings us to 2.0. A stable API is 2.0. A stable API is 2.0. Uh, yeah, Not a you're API. right. But, but, so ship, but there's a difference between being ship ready and shipping. And okay. That, that's actually, so here's, here's the, the concept of ship ready from, an, from a lean perspective is that if somebody wanted to use Crowbar as a deployment pro platform, they could start using it. And we were, we were maintained sprint by sprint uh, readiness. We're not going to tear the thing apart and have it broken. Right, that's, that's, really, that's really what we're talking about with this, is that what is, um, we, we're keeping the product in a ready state. Not that we are releasing it, and that's that's the critical difference. Um, so, right to me, it's more we're going to keep it not broken than anything else. But broken, let's define broken. Broken means the you can't drive it with an API, um, uh, and broken. it still do what it says on the tin. Broken means that we we haven't regressed any func any feature any capabilities of Crowbar in the effort to add new ones. That's what that's what I'm talking about. So sprint by sprint, no feature regression, which sounds like a note to me. It sounds like well, duh, but it's very common for us in adding capabilities to break things uh, in traditional development. And so what we're really trying to do here is say, look, we've got it working. We're going to we're gonna not break it, and which means there's a level of CI and automated tests and things like that that are covering it. Um, OK. Because it, it, we have a serious problem if somebody uh, comes in, uses uses Open Crowbar, deploys some nodes in it, and then they take a they they do a pull and it's busted. Now, yeah, we we probably need to start doing the the sprint contract of saying, all right, at, you know, in inside the sprint, okay, it might be it might not be as safe, but outside the sprint. 
or the sprint boundaries, we should have a working a working stable point, or we should start establishing stable points. And part of it is that we actually need to have we need to establish stable tags, stability tags. I think might be part of the process that we want to talk about. Ah, good. Thank you. That's the way to do it. I'm not sure I like the word stability, um, but uh, they're milestones. They're right. They're inner. The in, intra milestone tags. It's really intro release tags. Mm -hmm. So going from most abstract to least abstract to the longest term, you have releases and milestones, then sprint products. Right. Then, ideally, ideally the sprints line up with the milestones. That's right. But some so some milestones might... require two or more sprints. Correct. The the idea with a milestone is I want us to be able to say, "Got everything looks good. We're stable. This this is great. Cut that because somebody can count on it." Yeah. And then we'll, what we'll probably call that just I mean. OpenStack does exactly this, right? They do it on a monthly, monthly, every, every other release, every other sprint, effectively every month. They have a dot, you know, it would be an a dot one, a dot two, a dot three milestones leading up to the release. Since we're only going to have eight, uh, six sprints per quarter, uh, basically every sprint's going to need to be. I don't think I don't think they would be. I think they'd be uh, alpha dot release dot uh, numeric. Um, then we might as well just stay with Semper and say the API is stable. We have feature number. You know, we have new features here. You know, two, three, four for features, and then bugs, patches. The only reason why that doesn't work is that I don't expect, from a Sember perspective, that the broom release is going to be different and uh, um, have, have a different Sember top top level version. Right? So when we get to D. We're not going the Dremel. We're not going to have um, uh, three two dot one. Uh, we we might have two dot one at that point. So we we'll have to think through how that works. If the API isn't changing, mm -hmm. we don't need beta. Right. I expect the API will change. So. Okay. So. I mean, we'll, when we get to the D release, we'll figure out if that's 2.1 or if it's 2.0 uh, delta, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, I, I think it is meaningful to say, all right, this is our API version, and then the feature capability is described by the alpha broom or camshaft. Um, and that's, that's why, actually, you might want two vectors here. So you have your December versioning for the API, right? Well, Sember is API, then feature, then patch. Okay. Oh, so the, uh, you'd be 2.0, Anvil, the end of the release, which would be 2.1 from that perspective. Um, here it is. Oops, sorry. Um, on the share, I have Ember. The first is a major, which is the incompatible API changes. Second is when you add functionalities in a backwards compatible manner. And the third is patch. That makes sense. So uh, effectively, I think if we wanted to map this to Ember, it would be two dot anvil dot 
uh, one for the first sprint, dot two for the second sprint. But we might have milestones that are more frequent than sprint, or less frequent. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time trying to figure that out right now, because I think that we're going to hopefully it'll be a natural. We'll find that past level thing as a natural consequence. Mm -hmm. Um, and it could be that what we're what we need to do is look at using uh, feature branches more than we than we wanted to. Um, so I, I want to take a little bit of time and talk through what things should be in this um, upcoming spring in in the in the release target for Anvil. Uh, uh, right. I mean, because we have all the technical debt. Uh, you know, Rails two, uh, Rails four, Ruby two, Chef eleven, uh, Postgres, and a three. It'll probably be Puppet three. Puppet three. Oh. Okay. I actually consider that a feature right now. Not a technical debt. Mm, okay. Um, the right online. I, I call it inline. It's um, right. So there's there's some technical debt things that we've done that we needed to do for a whole a long time. Right. The repos converged. Actually, some of this is is back to community accessible. These are all things in that in that bucket. Um, so this was the first most important thing: get far, having all those all those repos converged, uh, so that core is one thing, right? Uh, OpenStack is its own thing, just but just one thing um, to be much more uh, straightforward with that. Uh, and actually, part of this repos converged would include Berkshelf. And then uh, there's feature sets that we definitely want to be able to uh, demonstrate, like having a header of heterogeneous OS deployments. So I, I consider this pretty much done. Um, I consider this done. Um, yeah, okay. Um, this, is, this part is done. This is uh, in process. Uh, this we haven't tested this, so we actually have to look at it. The RPM we're, we're that's work in process with the RPM stuff, and this online mode is done. Um, oh, let's see. So some of the other baseline stuff we had talked about is uh, AP, uh, REST API state REST APIs. I think we've accomplished uh, that to a large extent. CLI normalization. Uh, we have BDD test coverage uh, over API and um, UI, which is something we we hadn't fully achieved with Turbo One. Is there another important capability block that I've I'm missing in this. Um, upstream. The ability to use upstream code sources without having to customize for crowbar. It's part of, I guess, community accessible, but more so than community accessible. Um, yeah. Upstream Actually, one of, one of our baselines was uh, allow multiple deployment technologies, right? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was one of the major. And then there's another thing in here, which is uh, flexible networking. Oh, yes. This is done. Um, and plus, we added IPv6 into this. Um, 
And so one of the things that's going to be important with this release is, is the things that we put in critical features we're going to need to have demonstrated with QA. And so I think this is why we're not, this, isn't, this is a straw man proposal so that we can actually say, all right, all these things that we're saying are done in the Anvil release, we're going to stand up, demonstrate, and say this is complete. Um, I'm not sure uh, in-place upgrade is actually a requirement in, in Anvil. I don't think it's actually a requirement um, in uh, Broom. Well, I guess ostensibly, yeah, you couldn't upgrade a first release. You'd need to upgrade to the second release. <laughs> right. That's that's why I'm yep. <laughs> Um, do we want to add for the folks who are um, committed to Docker the um, uh, Docker the deployment platform? That is, Docker is a we ship we ship Crowbar in a in a container. Um. I don't. I'd, I'd be interested to see if there's if there's interest and demand for that. Um, we definitely could. I would. I would let that happen organically. Yeah. I, I think we've we've done a lot to do the Docker admins. I need to sit down with those guys and show them the hotness uh, because they should be happy. Um, the Docker community should be pretty happy with, with what we did because I, I think it's pretty cutting edge. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the OpenStack, uh, RefStack, and Teacup stuff I'm doing is uh, also very Docker Docker friendly. Mm -hmm. Are there other other important capabilities or features? Well, the critical feature, the core of Crowbar, you don't even you don't mention, which is the annealer. <laughs> That's true. It's just magic, um, but it's not really a release target to me. It's um, I mean, so some of some of I guess what you would put in this is that um, orchestration has just, has, it operates with discrete parts. Mm -hmm. Yes, -E -E. um, with good error messages, with uh, clear error messages, failure modes, clear error messages, dependency graph, uh, and failure modes. Right, I mean, some of the way that we built the annealer is consequence of the design pattern we, we were following, but also the need to have the orchestration engine be a very specific graph, be laid down, um, and fail very visibly and, and easy, easy to troubleshoot. Because one of the big challenges with Crowbar 1 is that failures were incredibly hard to diagnose. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's the funny thing about about this type of list. The annealer is not a feature. It's uh, it's strategy. An, well, it's it's an it's the architectural underpinnings of what we've done. Um, but I don't think we're leveraging it much yet. Anyway, every, it uses everything uses it, but we're still going to be finding you know defining new role types. Um, I think that's a lot of what's going to happen in Broom. We're going to find new new role types. It's a good list. Yeah, it's it's really Something good. Else is hmm. I had a let me see what the talk my talking points. Because a lot of these things are documented in the 
Okay, more company. Hello, if, if you're on the call, please, um, oh, or I think we just lost somebody. Um, Kevin, are you still there? Uh, if We only have a couple minutes left, but if, you're, if there's something interesting or you have questions, I'd, I'd love to have, uh, hear your voice and, and see what's, what you're interested in hearing more about. I know we have another another person on the line. That's me, Rob Wayne. Oh, hey Wayne. Hi hey, Wayne. Cool. This is this is uh, a topic that came up in yesterday's uh, retro, and so I've I've been working with Judd to put together the critical features list. I'm assuming you've been listening for a little while. How I heard it beep about ten minutes ago. Oh, scale. That's one of the ones we missed. Scale mm -hmm. to greater than 100. Actually, that's a feature. Well, so that that we want to demonstrate. Um, Large parallel deployment. Yeah. Uh, and online mode, okay, we have, we put online mode in the list. Attribute injection is part of just part of the system, which is upstream cookbooks, cleanups, installation process. Okay. Cool. Good. feel pretty good about it. Yeah, this, this the, the design call next week will be really good. I've been, I've been doing a lot of work, and um, with the rest of my uh, my intersprint day, I'm going to write a, a blog post about um, simulated annealing and epigenetics. Um, cool. Epi, epigenetics are the uh, sort of a a rethinking of um, what is the motor. Of uh, of evolution and of mutation and of metamorphosis, um, and that uh, accounting much more for environment and habitat of life forms or of robots. Um, ah, that's the link was okay. Did you did you read the uh, swarm patents that Altaus and I put together? I have not yet read the swarm patent. <laughs> that's that's actually. Part of the um, genesis of Crowbar was actually around what, and the reason why BDD is written in Erlang is because we started to prototype the swarm, swarm deployment, swarm uh, uh, environmental evolutionary based deployment. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Still trying to get there. We've almost built it. Almost yeah. built the infrastructure that could handle it. Um, and the uh, the new paper from Google on Dremel is is worth an eyeball. She shot me that link. Yeah, I dropped it in the architecture um, list. Yeah, is that you think that's something that sounds like something it would take on Hadoop? Um, they work in parallel, actually. It's, um, oh, complements it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's even actually kind of old. It's from at least 2010. Do um, hmm. Boy, I want to go to the international conference on very large databases. <laughs> <laughs> like ten people at that at that conference. All right. Um, we're way off topic. We're way off topic. So I, I'm I'm ready. To, I mean, we're done. We've had an hour. I think this is a really good. A really good draft. Um, in in the true nature of irony, uh, I uh, I will distribute this work um, inside of our team first, even though we've been discussing it in the community for uh, an hour. Uh, Judd, I guess you're going to do the normal wrap up. Oh, we were going to do a, an agenda. That's what I was looking at. Agenda for the next call. I'll do it at the bottom. Somewhere. Mm. 
So uh, I think Berkshelf would make sense. Where's the agenda for the next one? On the uh, I added it to the not that one, the other one. There you go. I added it to the bottom. It just hasn't shown up yet. Weird. Frustrating. Might have lost my changes since I just reconnected. Nope, there we are. Uh, and the provides role. And Wayne, if you're still still on, did you want to um, talk about the proper check at all? Um, no, I really haven't uh, gotten to the point where I think it'd be interesting yet. I will okay. soon. I I think those two um, those two topics are probably enough. Just need to make sure we we pull Victor in on it. Yeah, those will be good. Maybe um, that would work, be worth doing. <laughs> I am not going to be on that call. Uh, so I, that. I am busy having a diagnostic medical procedures. I'd rather be on the call. Um, yeah, the yeah I got this blog thing to write. That'll be fun. Um, Good. All right. Definitely. Talk about. So we've planned out some of the topics for our next call, um, and uh, we got a tremendous amount done um, here on this planning call, talking about the the future releases and strategies for Open Crowbar. The Open Crowbar Project and Crowbar. Um, thanks for joining, everybody. Thanks for listening back at home. And uh, we are going to sign off and catch you next time. Everybody, thank you, Jed. Really good.